You're listening to the Picks from the Paddock, Turf Talk podcast. And Red Brown with a tremendous chance of winning his third national. He jumps it clear of Jeff Stoneboy. He's getting the most tremendous cheer from the crowd. They're winning him home now. The 12-year-old Red Brown being preceded only by loose horses. Being chased by Church Stoneboy. I catch him as moved into third with a Bill Garlic force. They're coming to the elbow. There's a furlong now between Red Brown and his third grand national triumph. And he's coming up to the line to win it like a fresh horse in great style. It's hats off for the tremendous reception you've never heard by like it at Liverpool. Get them wins the national. A horse who is pure class, Frankel, has destroyed them from halfway. An amazing performance as Frankel heads towards the line to make every single yard in the Guinness a win it well. You're listening to the new series of the Turf Talk podcast with myself, Rory Paddock, as always, Chris Connolly, and a new addition to the PFTP lineup, Matt. How are you doing, gents? Good, Rory. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so much. Cheers. Good, good, good. Now, unlike what we're used to, where we'd have a weekly podcast, we're going to make it a little bit easier for you guys, the listeners. We're going to do a weekly, I guess, uh, Saturday sort of preview in terms of all the big action, which we're doing now. And... Earlier in the week, we're also going to do a bit of a news discussion sort of roundup. So this one, we're having a look ahead to action from Newbury, action from Doncaster, and the return of Cheltenham uh, with a decent bit of action as the jump season season starts to get underway, gents. Starting with two races at Newbury on ITV this weekend, first of which is the 220. It's a one mile four furlong group three race was the St. Simon Stakes. Uh, pretty close in the betting with the first three. Uh, Mirando, Royal Line and Young Rascal. Only six go to post. Start with you, Matt. Where's your money going in this? Well, I think, um, obviously, Mirando, who heads the market, is um, obviously obviously favoured by the conditions. He loves, he loves the soft ground. All his best performances so far this season have been on on very testing ground, notably at Chester early on in the um, earlier on in the season, and then and then obviously on his last run at Ascot when it was particularly um, testing going, he, he, he absolutely sluiced up that day. Um, he's favoured by the weight. Um, obviously, he's five pound um, better off with the second favourite, which is John Gosden's Royal Line. Um, Obviously, Miranda rated 118, Royal Line 113, both running off nine stone seven. So obviously, he's 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 favoured by the 
the weights in comparison to the second favourite. Royal Line actually ran really well at Ascot last time over a trip that probably stretched him a little bit, but he's a November handicap winner of last year. Um, also thrives on uh, softish ground and, you know, he's arguably still improving at the age of five. He hasn't had a hard season. Um, he's obviously, I think, the main threat. And obviously... You know, you can never rule out Mark Johnson's horse, King's Advice, who's improved massively all season. And with it being such a small field with no obvious pace, he could he could actually get quite an easy time um, on the lead. Um, but he's he's also had a long, tough season. So I, I, I guess the safest option would be Mirando. Chris, obviously, we look at Young Rascal. That was uh, relatively well fancied for the Derby not too long ago uh, last season. Obviously, you've got to respect the likes of William Haggis' horse, who's course and distance winner. And they're really, compared to the other five, well, sorry, compared to four other rivals, um, has had a really light campaign. Been very disappointing, though. Surely, if it's anything like its best, it would potentially trounce a field like this. Well, you have to look at this race from last season, Rory. Uh, Miranda and Young Rat School actually dead heated. There's no differential in terms of the weight concession. Miranda, once again, has to give three pounds to Young Rascal. The problem with Young Rascal, despite the the appealing look to him in terms of his very likely race this season, is that he's disappointed badly twice. Um, and you can always forgive a horse for doing it once, but to follow up that his run at Newmarket the last day was absolutely lifeless. Perhaps he wants softer ground. He's definitely got his ground for Saturday, but he's he's got a question mark over him. And you know, I, you don't want to dismiss horses. When you know when they're so unexposed in, in terms of a year, and he, he could have more to come, but Miranda is a, the solid option. He bolted up last time. Royal Line, you know, he only he only ran last week. He ran a really nice race in fairness before emptying. Just a side note with Royal Line, John Gosden's going through a quiet spell at the minute. He's had quite a few turned over at short odds. So, as much as I respect Royal Line and agree with Matt that he could be still an improving type, I think Miranda is a a solid option and. It would be a little bit disappointing from my point of view if Miranda didn't see these off. I know he's had a long enough season, but unless it gets ridiculously trappy, I just see him running them down. And at around five to two, I think he's he's definitely the value in the market. Yeah, I agree with you, gents. I can't have Royal. Uh, sorry, Young Rascal. Um, I think the biggest threat will be Royal Line. I was looking through the form earlier. John Gosden had a winner tonight. Uh, also had the winner yesterday. So potentially um, a starting to get his horses going again for the right at the back end of the season um, but no I agree with you Mirando um, I agree with you Matt King's advice potentially a, an outsider that could go relatively well but no Mirando for me I think it's a general consensus moving on chaps the next race on ITV uh, is another one from Newbury I know you're very 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 keen on the favourite here uh, it's a 250 7 furlong group 3 race uh, registers of the Horace Hill or what was the Horace Hill uh, Ken Ross you're all over Matt yeah he made a huge impression I thought at um, Newmarket three weeks ago when he won his maiden um, with any amount in hand um, he beat a previous winner that day in Raib who then after after finishing second to King Ken Ross a, a, a well beaten second to King Ross then went to Kempton on uh, Tuesday evening, I believe, and, and won easily there, a heavily back favourite, won easily. It's just the way that Kinross travelled in that race that day for a horse, you know, obviously an inexperienced horse making his debut at, at, at quite a, a big, starey, wide open track like Newmarket. He was very professional that day. He ran a little bit with the choke out um, throughout the race, which which actually made his finishing effort even more impressive. The fact that he was he was going further away at the line, he hit the line really strongly, and just sometimes you can just it's always hard to tell after after one run, but he made such an impression that day. You can only imagine, it, it, you know, if he improves, you know, a little bit coming on from his first run after that, you, you can only imagine that he's gonna gonna actually be a serious horse. Chris, anything yeah. to take Kim Ross on with? Uh, no, I don't think so, Rory. It's, we don't know enough about Boccaccio. He's won on totally different ground. I would agree with Matt on Year of the Tiger. The thing with Year of the Tiger, no matter how well-bred he is and what sort of mark he has, he's had plenty of runs. 
you know, you'd be concerned at that at this time of year against horses who have only had one or two starts. A conceivable danger is Kenzai Warrior, who won well on debut for Roger Teal. Uh, the problem with that horse is, you know, he won on good ground. I mean, the form of that race wasn't too bad. He made all that day, I believe, as well. So he might have more to come. But, but I think this is probably there for Kinross, and I'd be, I'd be happy to go with Ma. I mean, at least he's won with some sort of rain in the ground. Um, I mean, the, the draw could be an interesting factor. He's drawn nine, but you would expect him to have the class to overcome these. And, you know, Ralph Beckett's been going through a purple patch at present, so I wouldn't want to be taking him on. Yeah, I mean, everything points to the favourite going well, I think, six to five. I wouldn't say it was generous, but it, it's a fair price. Uh, and, when you, and when you look at a horse priced up at such short odds, and you still consider it to be relatively fair and perhaps even I think there's a bookmaker offer in uh, 11 to 8, you'd say that's very generous. Um, you, you've got to consider that as a very, very well-fancied and very capable of horse. I think if we had to throw one in the mix just as a... Uh, if punters were looking for any sort of each-way punt, I think graffiti force, potentially, simply because it's gone well on the ground before. Um, at, you know, perhaps a, a bigger price, around 20, 25 to 1, if you're looking for each-way money. But no... I know it was very boring, just like the other race at Newbury, but I complete it with you guys. I think the classiest horse in the race is Kinross, and if it handles conditions, I think that's the only question mark, really. Then it should potentially uh, dominate a race like this. Sticking with the flat chaps, uh, the first race that's actually on ITV is the first race from Doncaster. Um, I know it's a bit of a playground for you, Chris. You, you absolutely love the Yorkshire course. Uh, the first race there is a six wheel and two year old race. Um, Art Power um, has, has a great chance there, as does the likes of Abarama Gold and Hong Kong. But the current market leader is the Michael Dodds Troubadour, priced at around three to one. Hasn't finished outside of the top two uh, in what are the things that last six runnings, uh, sorry, six rides. Um, very open. Anything that you like the look of in this, Chris? Yeah, I do like Art Power, to be fair. I mean, he's been very well backed, and the race, unfortunately for us, has cut up. Um, I would have liked to have had a go with Art Power each way. He's from there, Tim to be hard. Tim does particularly well up north. Um, he's been in good form of late. This horse absolutely bolted up the last day at York. I don't know how good that race was, to be fair. But, you know, he hammered a William Haggis horse, and he promised he had plenty more to come. I don't think he'll have any problem with the ground, and... You know, yesterday he was seven to one, which is a real shame because you know, twenty four hours on the race has cut up. He's now four to one. Um, I think if you could get five to around five to one, I'd be I'd be willing to play each way to get my money back. Uh, personally, um, I think Art Power is probably the one to be. But I'm with you. There's eight runners. There's there's that temptation to try and look for something that's perhaps each way value, but there's not really each way value there. I think. If you can get five to one, I know that some bookmakers are offering fives about Hong Kong. Um, if you can find anywhere that's offering eleven to two, I think an each way bet, as long as eight go to post, would probably be where I would go. Matt. Yeah, I think this is a bit of a nightmare race. Um, to be honest, I wouldn't be surprised if any one of the runners um, was successful. Um, I'd like to mention Hong Kong, like like yourself. Um, I think it was interesting that O'Brien had two other runners um, that were arguably slightly more fancied uh, for this race, but he's he's plumped for Hong Kong to represent him um, as his only runner. And um, like you say, I mean conditions are obviously going to going to prove um, no issue to him. He won a very heavy ground last time, which is quite interesting because he's uh, got an All American pedigree and that doesn't um that doesn't really scream uh bottomless ground um but there you go um so yeah i think i think i'll probably take a i'll probably take a chance on hong kong as well purely on the basis that he was the he was the pick of the um aiden o'brien bunch that were that were originally entered for this race yeah i mean it's a tough race you know i mean moving on uh speaking of aiden o'brien and obviously the Big Group 1 race of the day is what was the Racing Post Trophy, now known as the Verton Futurity Trophy Stakes. Obviously, it's been touched upon a lot in the media. There's six go to post now, five of which are trained by Aidan O'Brien. 
Red Hot favourite in the form of Mogul, 2 to 1 on. Um, in his three, near his rival at 4 to 1, and then we've got the uh, the English only competitor with Andrew Baldin's uh, Kamiko. Shortly, it's the favourites to lose. Matt? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, what can we say about this race? Um, <laughs> it's much dom- isn't it? <laughs> do- do- dominated by Coolmore. I think we can, you know, I could, I could sum this up quite quickly. It's a, obviously it's a, it's an, it's a no bet race, but um, in, in my mind, I'd like to see Mogul win this impressively. So, you know, um, as a potential candidate to um, challenge Pinatubo and all the major uh, three road races next season, I. Uh, yeah, Chris, Mogul's to lose. Uh, well, well, it's. I between, mean, especially but... with six runners, there's not going to be much each way value, is there? Well, there's no, it's a no bet race, total no bet race, Rory. You couldn't be back in Kamiko or anything else each way in this race. I would like to see Mogul win it. If Mogul didn't win it, I'd like to see Innistri win it. Yeah, they're both good horses in their own right, and Innistri actually won the Beresford Stakes, I think that was last month, on heavy ground, so I wouldn't totally discount a small upset here. It's just a terrible group one, isn't it? I mean, six runners, five Aidan O'Brien horses, one UK trained horse, it's a... It's a terrible turnout, really poor. I mean, we don't want to labour on the fact that, you know, the UK trainers and owners have obviously run away a tail between legs, but there is no Pinatubo here. The, you know, there are a couple of highly regarded Aidan O'Brien types, but, you know, there's not a Pinatubo, there's not a Siskin or anything like that from what we know. So, yeah, you know, hopefully Mogul wins. If he doesn't, hopefully industry wins. It's a desperate race. Um, hopefully they at least have, you know, hopefully one of the O'Brien horses goes off like a score with a cat and sets a decent clip, but... Yeah, Mogul are in his free for me. I wouldn't touch this through stolen money, though, so it's a instantly forgettable race, I would feel. Yeah, it's not his best renewal. I mean, potentially, I mean, we were looking previously that some of the horses that have won this race, and Mogul could potentially, and, you know, maybe in his free to an extent, could potentially turn out to be a very decent horse. But if they do, then this isn't going to be the pinnacle of their career by any stretch of the imagination. Now, one race that we can get stuck into is the 4 o'clock at Doncaster. 18 runner, massive sprint handicap, loads of former course and distance winners. The one I like is actually the red, uh, the, sorry, the rank outsider in the field, uh, Foulard. Um, I think if people were looking for an each way bet, I think 50 to 1 is probably a generous price. Um, is it the likeliest of winners? No, certainly not. But I think something that's very, very key when you're looking at races at Doncaster is horses that have course form. This horse has raced at Doncaster on six previous occasions. Two wins, two places. Um, He's running off a really decent handicap mark as well. Obviously, you know, at the age of eight, it's not exactly at the peak of his powers, but when we're looking at sprinters, eight isn't really much of an age. Um, Yes, it comes from a smaller yard. Yes, it's ridden by a horse that's claiming... uh, Sorry, ridden by a get my words out, a jockey that's claiming three pounds, but you know what, Foulard to put up a decent each way showing, 50 to 1, yeah, I think that's decent, uh, fellow course and distance winners like Orvar, Sahik, uh, Makana also have a chance, as does Tarbouche, uh, you know, I couldn't put anyone off back in them either, but no, Foulard for me, Chris, yeah, it's a tricky race, is this Rory, I mean, the time of year doesn't help, Initially, I fancied that um, a Dean Ivory trained horse in this stake of claim. He's been pulled out since yesterday, so that's rather off putting for me. Uh, one horse I've been interested in this race, or a horse in particular I've been interested in all season, is Princess de Sables. Now, she's only a three year old. She made quite an impression when winning on good firm ground at Haydock. It actually astonished me because I had her for winning on soft ground. The handicapper took a, an almighty swipe at her, and she hasn't reproduced that effort, but she does act on soft or heavy going and it wouldn't be a total surprise given she's only three and likely race compared to some of these for her to bounce back i mean she's going to have to bounce back but around 25 to 1 she's very interesting um if i was going to have a second play for the sake of having one i think mr lupton despite having nine stone ten he's got a very capable three pounds claimer in corner murder on board you know this is a former group two winner won't have no problem with the conditions richard fire he had have been going well all season so uh, he's an interesting outside in what looks a hot race there ought to be plenty of pace on so you know this looks like being a, a very very good race 
Matt, I know that you were keen on a horse that unfortunately has now been pulled from this race and is set to run tomorrow, Friday at Doncaster. Um, taking that horse out now, is there anything that's still left in the race that you like the look of? Yeah, well, I've, I've I've obviously given it a little bit more thought now, and I've I've I've, I've reviewed it again. And sometimes when you, you know, obviously with these large field handicap sprints, you, you you look for the you look for where the pace is coming from. You look from obviously because they're drawn wide across the track. You you look to see where the pace is, um, whether it's going to be low or high. And uh, and I think actually interestingly, um, in this race, there's pace low and high a moment of madness um as we know i think he won the portland at doncaster last year making all the running he's drawn low and the other the other obvious pacemaker is copper knight who's also a very very fast horse and has had quite a, a um successful season but obviously he's climbed in the weights accordingly he's drawn high dark shot is another horse that can run handy he's he's in the middle so i think we'll Whichever horse you fancy, whether it's low or high, I think you're going to have plenty enough pace to 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 tow you along. And I think I think it's probably going to set it up for a closer. So Tarbouche will probably track um, Moment of Madness on the far side. Um, came from the dark is another horse that uh, a three year old trained by Ed Walker, who ran well at Ascot last time. Actually finished in in front of the horse I originally fancied this in this race. Call me Ginger. He was a fast finisher that day. So I think. I think a strong run race will definitely suit him. He could follow Dark Shot up the middle, and then you've got Copper Knight obviously leading leading the runners on on the stand side. But um, probably fancy one of the three year olds um, to probably improve enough to, to 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 beat these older older type sprints. I think obviously come from the dark, who's probably the the shortest of the three year olds in the betting. I think he'll appreciate a strong strong run race, and, and obviously got the assistance of Gerard Mosse. On board, and the other two three-year-olds who are absolutely on a roll at the moment is Richard Far. He's Fairy Stories, who's won her last three. Um, absolutely got no weight whatsoever. She runs off eight stone with uh, Sean Davis claiming another three. Whether he'll be able to do that or not, I'm, I'm not quite sure because um, I think he'll have to. I think he'll probably struggle to to, to take three off eight eight stone. But um, I think she's got a massive chance, and the. The other three-year-old of David Brown's four-wheel drive has done nothing wrong um, this season. He's holding his form re- really well. So I'd probably, I'd probably out of out of all of them, I'd take a take a punt on the three three-year-old. I think that pretty much puts pay to the uh, the flat racing now, and we jump codes and ITV have got four over jumps from the pinnacle home of jumps racing that is Cheltenham. Uh, the first of which is a ridiculously competitive three mile one furlong handicap chase where Captain Catterstock and Cogri are joint favourites or vying for favouritism. Other horses in there, you've got the likes of the Young Master, Captain Chaos, uh, Rock the Casbah, Vintage Cloud, West Approach. Horses that potentially have very varied or different targets for the rest of the season. Um, very close in the betting as it stands at the moment. Obviously, not all the leads will run. I'll throw my sort of hat into the ring first. Uh, the horse that I actually like in Lace is, again, one of the rank outsiders. Um, trained by Philip Hobbs, who tends to do well at this time of year. Rolling Dillon. Um, it's never really won a major race, Rolling Dillon, but I think a lot of people forget some of the big, big races he's run. Just look at the end of last season, he finished fifth in the Bet365 Gold Cup. His jumping is pretty much impeccable. I don't think he's fallen for a very long time, if at all. Um, whether or not he perhaps has the classes and the likes of these, you know, is, is, is up for debate. But I think rolling Dylan to potentially sneak a place at a decent enough price would be where I would go with this. Chris? Yeah, mine would be, would be straight on Cogri. Um, he's won this race before. He's run well in it before. He's on a winnable mark of 139. Um, you know, like, he jumps for fun. I mean, this is a one attractive thing about this horse. He always goes well fresh. He always tends to... He, he just impresses every time he's jumping. I mean, he was only narrowly denied last year. He, he put in such a brave effort that you think this would be the target. Again, it looks the obvious target for him. Um, and he would be a player around 8-1. to I think he's... I think he's a good thing, providing he jumps round. Um, he did unseat at the back end of last term, but 
Oh, for 139, he makes plenty of appeal in what is a, a wide open race. I mean, there are plenty of others to go with. Cross Bar- uh, Park for Caroline Bailey. You know, he makes plenty of appeal. I just wonder. I just wonder what the overall target for that horse is. I mean, he improved at quite a rate of knots last term. He'll have no problem with the ground. You'd expect him to be running on. Of the other ones, I mean, Roland Dillon, Keeper Hill, they've got chances, but White Moon would be very interesting as a seven-year-old. I mean, he's got 10 stone 10. I think Matt will probably touch upon him a little bit more. He's a very interesting horse for the Tizards. And Vintage Clouds on a going day could have some sort of say, but it is wide open, small stakes, and Cogger gets my vote. And Matt, obviously, Chris touched upon White Mew, Mike Moon. I know it's a horse that you think has a decent enough chance. Is it one that you'd side with, though? Yeah, I mean, obviously, you'd have to agree with Chris on 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 Kogri. He's a, he's a standing dish in these types of races, particularly at Cheltenham. Um, he's trained by Nigel Twiston Davis, who always has his horses um, fit and ready to go this time of year. You know, you can pretty much hang your hat on the fact that he's he's gonna he's gonna run a he's gonna run a race. Um, uh, we haven't mentioned the favourite actually yet, Captain Catterstock. If he actually if he actually runs for Paul Nichols, he's only a six year old, and um, you know he could have any improvement in him um, this time round. He's a massive horse, and you can only imagine he's going to improve. But whether you'd actually take a chance on on backing at, what's the second season novice at seven to one and. Um, in, in a competitive race like this round Cheltenham, I, I, I think he's arguably a tad short, particularly on the level of form he's he, he's shown so far. Um, yeah, I think I think I think White Moon is very interesting. I think um, he was very impressive in winning two starts, uh, two novice hurdles um, two seasons ago, and I, I think anything I think they thought anything he achieved. As a hurdle, as a hurdler with a bonus, I think they always thought they were going to go chasing with him, and you could argue that he was he was slightly disappointing um, uh, last season, albeit mixing it with the, with some of the best novice chasers around. He did have a fall early on, which maybe affected his confidence slightly because his jumping wasn't wasn't fantastic uh, uh, in some of his races. But I I just I can't help feeling that he's only a seven year old. He's had he's had a, a year off. And I think he's a horse with tons of ability, and I, I, I think an official rating of 137 could could be well within his well within his compass. And you know, I think I think obviously with with a clean round of jumping, which is absolutely absolutely crucial, obviously particularly at Cheltenham, because albeit a stay and race, they're going to they're going to go a good clip round here and. You know, you, you you need to be on it with 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 your jump, and you can't afford to make too many mistakes around here. I th- I think he's got a serious chance, and an, another horse I'd throw in if he actually if he actually gets a run is um, just a sting for Harry Fry, who's also only a seven year old, and he actually went off quite a short price for the um, Bet Three Six Five at the end of last season, um, formerly known as the Whitbread. And they really, I think they really fancied him for that race, but he no he ran no no sort of race for whatever reason, but. Um, I think he's another horse that's probably better than a 134 rated horse being only a seven year old. I think he's he's potentially got some it got some improvement in him, but I think he'll need a few of these to come out if he's going to get a run. But uh, yeah, white white moon for me. Perfect, gents. Moving on to the next race at Cheltenham, the 2:35. We're seeing some youngsters here tackle hurdles. Uh, reasonably short price favourite is Torpedo. Nigel Twiston Davis tends to have his horses running well at the moment. Um, I think Soviet Pimpernel might be a bit of a, a bit of a player um, coming from Peter Farney's yard. Keldestan flattered to deceive on the flat when was heavily backed. Uh, but Matt, I'll come to you first for this race. To be a, to be a worthy favourite, do you think in a race like this? Probably, probably based on the fact, like, like, like I said before, Nigel Twiston Davis is an absolute master um, during the autumn, the early part of the season. I mean, there, there is a case they could make a case for the fact that he's possibly bullied some slightly inferior opposition to to get to the to get to the stage where he is. And I think, you know, I think it'll have to be, I think it'll have to be fairly decent to win this off one four eight. Um, obviously. Um, Kel Destan on based on his exploits of last season. So obviously yeah, he's carrying his penalties, and I don't think one four two is a ridiculous um, 
mark for him and obviously he was very disappointing heavily, heavily backed favourite at Bath to win off a off a, um, a ludicrously lower uh, flat rating um, for whatever reason he, he he couldn't manage to win that day he didn't run he didn't run poorly he just uh, he just looked a bit slow but um, you know like I said he you know he has been running over hurdles and perhaps he perhaps you know it was his first run for a while and Perhaps he just needed it a little bit. So um, one at a slightly longer price I'd be interested in is Fan Fan de Soy for Tom George. I think he's quite attractively weighted off 136. He showed some nice form um, earlier on uh, in the season last year and then thrown in the deep end a little bit at Cheltenham, but ran ran respectably. And I think, you know, with a, with a summer holiday on his back, he could come back a slightly stronger horse, and I, I'd, I'd definitely be interested in in Fan Fan de Soya uh, around the seven to one mark. Grace, um, obviously, we touched when we were speaking at Doncaster about course form being very important. I know that obviously with Cheltenham there's various courses, but how important do you think course form is at Cheltenham? I mean, we've got the likes of Cal Dastan, who's a course and distance winner, but we've also got Nelson River, who's also won over the course, um, yeah. and also uh, I think we've got another in there. We do. Um, it's the uh, Henry de Bromhead uh, having a good time. Now, something that's perhaps a little bit interesting and, uh, and it's caught my eye is that um, Henry de Bromhead's horse is set to be ridden by Richard Johnson. Now, in my recollection, I can't remember those two teaming up very often in terms of a trainer and jockey combination. Firstly, is course form important at Cheltenham or as, in, as important? And I think it's worth noting Johnson and De Bromhead as a team. Oh, absolutely. You definitely respect any horse at this time of year from the Henry De Bromhead yard. He's had winners here before. Uh, and Rich Johnson's a very eye catching booking. Moving on to the part about, you know, course form at Cheltenham. I mean, as a general rule of thumb, I would say yes, it is very important to prove you act at Cheltenham. However, these are only four year olds. You know, they've got plenty of time. And if they've flopped here before, it's likely because they've run in races that are just too good for them. Um, you touched upon a, a course winner in Nelson River. I think he's got a very good chance of 1-4-2. Um, it's highly possible that this is... He'll, he'll have been trained for this, I would have thought. I mean, Tony Cowell's been going great guns, but with the likes of Quel Destin, um, Torpio may be a little bit overrated in terms of what he's been beating. And the chances of all the Irish horses turning up, I would imagine, is unlikely. So... You know, the current odds, I think, are around 6-1 to one Nelson River. He's a course winner. He was higher rated than Quel Destin on the flat. The big problem I have with Quel Destin, apart from the penalty, is he, he was either unfit the last day at Bath, badly unfit, or he, he sinked it. And to me, he looked like a horse who stuck his head in the air and said, no, thank you. You know, I don't like to see things like that. I know he's shown a good attitude over hurdles before, but it was, it was just something off-putting in that performance. And if it was just down to a basic lack of fitness, I wonder, you know, saying it was only 10, 11 days ago, how much fitter will it be today? So I'd be willing to take a chance with Nelson River each way. He's won here before, he's run well here before, he's run at the Cheltenham Festival, he finished behind Pentland, Lad, uh, Pentland Hills, I beg your pardon. Now, Corsa Blind was also in that race. It'd be very interesting if he turned up for Gordon Elliott. However, at this stage, I think it's unlikely. So Nelson River each way for me at 6-1, to one, it is a chance being taken. And our power... He's a sort of interesting outsider for Alan King. I think he's around 14 to 1. He'd have been rated the highest of these on the flat. And, you know, if he's ready to go, he could run into a place at a decent price. Yeah, I think it's a tough one as well, especially doing this on a Thursday. We know, obviously, with the declarations for jump racing, I can't see, I'd probably say, at least half the field that are entered at the moment aren't actually probably going to take their, uh, take their entries. I, the favourite, I think, is probably a worthy favourite. I'm with you, there's a massive question mark over Calder Stan based on his flat run. Perhaps that's a bit unfair, maybe, but I just. It's, it's just an, an, an uneasy feeling, shall we just say. Um, so, you know what? I'm just going to take a chance uh, purely on the Johnson and uh, the Bromhead combination with a course winner in having a good time. Um, Acts on soft ground as well, so that's not going to be an issue. So yeah, having a good time. Currently twelve to one. I think an each way punt there. I think that's probably worthwhile. Uh, moving on, chaps. There's only two more races left to do. 
try and plough through these as quick as we can. We've got the 310, which is the Randox Health Handicap Chase. It's a class two, over two miles. Current favourite is Capeland. McGrathy isn't far behind, 11 to two. Brellandar, six to one. As is not Nana's six to one, eight to one bar. Um, perhaps it's a bit boring, but I'm going with another course winner here um, in the form of Maracuja. I saw it and do it for the village who also runs uh, in the same race, or potentially runs in the same race. Um, run at Chepstow last time, and in in patches it ran well. It finished eighth. It was, you know, it didn't pull up any trees, but Maracuja in patches ran well. But I don't think it was given much of a chance in terms of its positioning. Um, I think potentially it just needed that run. And the form around Cheltenham it has is pretty decent. 10 to 1, I think it's a relatively decent price as well. Maracuja is an each way bet. Yep, that'd be me. Gino Trail is an outsider potentially for Kerry Lee. Richard Johnson could go well at a price. Um, however, 225 days off. Slight concern. Um, San Calvados is entered, but I don't think this is going to be his target. I think he's going to run on Sunday at Aintree. Can you see out of the first, say, three or four in the betting, or do you think there's an outsider worth grabbing hold of, Chris? No, I'm with one towards the top of the market. I'm with Forrest Behan. Uh, Brian Ellison, horses are absolutely flying. I mean, the last fortnight, I think he's operating at a near 50% strike rate. He had a very well-backed horse win today. Uh, this horse actually finished behind the re-opposing McGrotty, the last day at Kemp, uh, Kelson, I beg your pardon. He, he didn't jump well on occasion. Um, he was ridden quite a way behind McGrotty as well. We've got a soft lead. I think he was about five or six lengths in front at one point. But he ran on towards the end of the race, suggesting that he would come on for it. Uh, I think of a workable mark of around 149, I beg your pardon. You know, he's won off marks this high before and gone close off higher marks. So... You know, he just looks a he looks one that Brian Ellison has put in to win, considering he's absolutely flying at the minute. You think that Kelso run, he's bound to improve from it. I wouldn't have thought McGraw would improve that much from that run. You know, you have to say that horse has won three on the trot now, but he's a front runner, and you have the potential for four or five of these to go from the front. I mean, I really like not Nanus, but he's a bit of a mad bastard. Um, he was the same over hurdles; you can tear off and not settle. He's one of them horses that's all or nothing. He has run some good races, so I just couldn't trust him. Say Calvados is another, very similar. It would be interesting to see if he actually runs. Gino Trail can go from the front. It's just one of them races you can see cutting up, and hopefully Forrest Behan sits in just behind, pounces over the last. Well, Forrest Behan you can even get with Paddy Power at the moment at 8-1, to one, so an each way decent bet there, Chris. Yeah, well, I'll take 8-1 to one if you can get it. <laughs> Matt, your thoughts? Yeah, um... As I said, uh, Paul Nichols holds a strong hand in this with with Capeland and Brella, and uh, be interesting to see if he runs them both. Um, touch on what Chris said earlier about Brian Ellison's horses are in incredible form. He's got he's got Forrest Behan, who's form ties in with McGrathy, who's obviously trained by uh, Richard Newland, who's quite a obviously as we know is quite a shrewd trainer. So he wouldn't be pitching him in here if he didn't think he had a serious chance. Um, the other Brian Ellison horse, Nietzsche, is a is a course winner. Over hurdles, he's um, he's a novice, and I I just slightly have a con- even though I think he's particularly well handicapped, possibly over over fences. I I'm just not convinced he's jumping's going to be slick enough to cut it with these um, more experienced chasers. So I'd side with Capeland uh, at the head of the market. I think he's only a seven year old still. I think he's 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 arguably his best forms uh, at the start of the season. He enjoys good ground. I could just see him tracking a, a, a frenetic pace round and um and pouncing with two to jump. I think um Paul Nichols had him in quite a few races at um uh, Cheltenham Festival last season, including some some grade one chases and uh, I, I think deep down he thought he was probably capable of, of competing in that type of race. So um, I think off mark a one four three, and you know, like, as I said, the fact that he goes well fresh, he'll enjoy the good decent ground, providing there's not a deluge and with a frenetic pace to to aim out. I could see him getting a nice toe around there and picking picking them off coming to the second last. I think so, Capelin for me. Yeah, and moving on, chaps, the final race that's going to be broadcast, albeit not in time order, but the final race that will be broadcast 
from Cheltenham is a three mile Potemps Network handicap hurdle. Obviously, it's a series qualifier for the big race in March. <sighs> Jeez, where do I even start? There's 24 sets to run. You know, I could pick out eight, nine, ten of these that I'd, I'd, I'd quite happily put some sort of bet on. Head of the market is, to be fair, in I right. A joint as it is at the moment at 7 1, but to be honest with you, the top 11 in the betting are all separated by just five points. Um, you know what? I'll come to you first, Matt. You know, I know that you like the clock is ticking, but is there anything else, or is uh, that pretty much where your money's going? Uh, absolute nightmare, nightmare race, isn't it? You to be honest, again, yeah. um, you know, I think I think it'd take. I think it'd take a mighty effort for to be fair to win this off 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 top weight on his seasonal debut. He's obviously a, a seriously talented horse. I mean, he run some appalling races at the early part of last season, and then came good at the Cheltenham Festival and just just missed out that day. Run a mighty race, and then and then followed that up with a with a victory. Um, but he's not getting any younger, and he's handicapped up to the hill. And I, I think it. I think. I mean, it appears to be it appears to be some significant support for him um, in the market. He obviously heads the market now, but um, I I just couldn't I just couldn't have him. I think, like as you as you mentioned, I think the clock is ticking as an interesting horse. There was plenty of support for him in some decent staying uh, chase handicaps at, at, um, in the spring of last year. I think is I think I obviously think this horse is is a lot more talented than he's actually shown so far. Albeit he has he has perform creditably in most of his races without without really looking like winning but you can't help feeling there's a bigger performance in this horse and he's significantly better handicapped over over hurdles I think than he is fences um so he's definitely one I'm interested in of the others there's also an unexposed six-year-old in the race trained by Warren Great Trek's owned by the Whaley Cones in printing dollars who is open to any amount of improvement and um that's a horse I'd definitely be interested in, um, but I think I think this is a race where I'd like to see what the market is doing um, in the lead up to this race. Maybe maybe three or four hours before, just to get an idea of which horses might be straight for this race and which horses might be maybe having having different plans later on in the season. So if I had to if I had to plump for two, it would be the clock is ticking and and uh, printing dollars for me. Chris, your thoughts? Oh, nightmare for race, Rory. Uh, to be fair, you know, I followed him a couple of seasons ago. He had a really fruitful spell. I actually fancied him a couple of seasons ago for the Potemps Network final at Cheltenham where he ran no sort of race. You know, I remembered him last season. I got on again at around 50 to 1 each way, and it was agonising watching him getting nailed up the running, but he held his form well thereafter. He won afterwards. He was impressive at Cheltenham at the time after, in all fairness. It would take a mammoth performance for him to win, but there are 24 of these, and trying to decipher the chances of all 24 looks impossible. I would agree with Matt. I think you have to look at uh, the market and see where the confidence is. I'm, I'm quite astonished, actually, there's a lot of confidence, to be fair, but I can still see him going well, despite this mammoth weight he has. Another one towards the top of the, uh, the weights is Sykes. This is an interesting type. Um, you know, he, only, he seems to only have one good runner season in him. It's normally a first time up. He ran second in this race last term. He's obviously a fragile horse, and the mark puts me off. It's a significant concern watching a horse having to lump around 11 stone 10, but this could be his Cheltenham Festival. So Sykes at around 12 to 1 makes plenty of appeal to me. Printing dollars is an interesting, unexposed horse. You just wonder with him, though, are they going to be... Is this a day they're going all out to try and win? Um, and the clock is ticking. Who is a, another very, very interesting horse? He's burnt. He's burnt some fingers. This horse. He reverts to hurdling. He's off a manageable mark, and off ten stone nine, he's got some sort of chance. However, his win record is he's just not good enough for a horse that is as obviously talented as he is. Mister Matthew is another outsider with a chance, but gun to head. You know, my mind tells me that Sykes. You're going to get one good run out of him a season. He will be. He will be ready for this. He'll be ridden up there. He could get an easy lead. I mean, depending on how hard the rest of them are trying, I genuinely think that this is the Cheltenham Festival for Sykes. So 12 to 1 each way. I think there are five or six places on offer. I think he's a logical bet, despite it being illogical at the weights. It's, I mean, it's such a, tough, such a tough one. I mean, I was going through the race myself, and 
I don't know if you guys do the same, but I ended up sort of, right, I'll try and give myself a bit of a short list and then try and narrow it down from there. And the four I've got on my short list are horses none of you have mentioned, just to make things really easy. Um, I like Robin the Raven. Uh, sorry, Robin the Raven. Uh, I think Kim Bailey's going well at the moment. Um, Mr. Mafia, again, Martin Keith is got, going pretty decent, uh, reasonably well at the moment, and obviously a local trainer. Um, a, 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 a slight inkling towards Gunfleet as well. Emma Lavelle, I think she's had three winners in the last 16, in the last two weeks. Um, and Gunfleet's form's not been great, but you look at the really poor performances. The poor performances on, have been on decent enough ground. Whenever you've seen anything with soft in, that's when he's put his best foot forward. Now, this is obviously a massive different sort of task compared to the, the, sort of the races he's won before. But I've just got perhaps a little bit of a suspicion that Gunfleet could be decent. Um, but one at a bigger price that really kind of catches the eye is two taps. Uh, I'm a fan of the skeleton yard anyway, but albeit 728 days off the track is a, well, it's an absolute nightmare. But looking through his form and at the age of nine, oh, just there's a bit in there that really makes me think that this horse has, has a decent chance. I mean, the last time it won a race it was a listed chase uh, in air back in April 2017 so even as a chaser it, it went it went reasonably well I mean this is a horse that finished third in the Close Brothers Novices chase at the Cheltenham Festival it's got on paper really decent form um, it's come third in the grade two over obviously the bigger obstacles um, so the fact that it reverts back to hurdling after such a lengthy break off I don't know what to make of that, in all honesty. I don't know whether or not this is just a prep run to go back over the bigger fences. I couldn't be certain whether or not they've had such a lengthy layoff because it just couldn't handle chasing anymore and they're going to campaign it over the smaller obstacles. I don't know. But it's a bit difficult to ignore a horse that's raced in such quality races before and done well in such quality races that now reverts to something relatively different after such a lengthy layoff. It also goes well fresh. Now, that might be taking it to an extreme, an extreme having, what, pretty much two years out. But two Tafts and Gunfleet as each way potential horses. But let's be honest, lads, you can't be confident about anything in this, can you? No, you could fire 23 bullets and lose. This is wide open. There is the obvious thing of whether they're all trying to win or not. You have yeah. horses like two Tafts who have been off. He spent more, you know, 728 days. It will be a mammoth training performance. However, Dan Skelton has pulled these stunts before. Um, it's just impossible, isn't it? It's impossible to discount any. It's impossible to to ignore any sort of market moves. I mean, I think that's the that would be the sensible thing from my point of view. You have to watch the market in these races. I mean, Rebecca Curtis, her horses have been absolutely flying. She has yep. Sunset Showdown. There are so many different angles to this race. There are so I many mean, interesting the ones thing going is, forward. None of us have even mentioned the favourite. I write Richard Johnson time, climbs aboard the uh, the six year old trained by Harriet Graham. The joint favourite would to be fair. Uh, you know, uh, won his last race, but again, uh, an absolute nightmare. So, that, for what they're worth, chaps, that's our thoughts on all the races that's going to be on ITV. I'm going to get you to nail your colours to the mast to a few. Um, win or each way, or two winners, or two place shouts, you know, whatever you want, chaps. I'm going to ask you to pinpoint two horses that are running this Saturday that you would put your money on. I'm going to come to you first, Matt. Which two get the Matt Polly seal of approval for this Saturday? Well, it has to be Ken Ross for me in the Horace Hill at Newbury. I, I was really, I was really um, awestruck by his, his, his debut winning performance at Newmarket. And I, as I alluded to earlier, I'd be, I'd be seriously disappointed if he couldn't win uh, at Newbury on Saturday. So he's my idea of a banker, albeit a, a prohibitive price, but. Um, I, I really want to see an impressive performance from him, and uh, maybe at a, maybe at a longer price. Um, probably, I'd probably I'd probably stick with the clock is ticking. So I, I definitely think he's got a I definitely think he's got a big performance 
I don't think he's got a big performance in him, and I couldn't see him being out of the first four. Chris? Yeah, I can't go against Cogrit around 8-1, to one, Rory. I just think his record in the race is record fresh, and you know the record of the yard at this time of year, everything points to a massive run. I think 8-1 to one is a very fair each-way bet. Yeah, and my other selection would be also an each-way selection, and that's Forrest Behan. I just can't ignore... The, the yard form of Brian Ellison, I think this would have been the early season plan. He was very respectable behind McGraw the last day. Obviously, there's been a slight swing in the weights. I think everything points to him having this run to sue and, you know, hopefully at least runs on late in the day to, to nick a, play, a place and hopefully, you know, first place. Uh, for what it's worth, chaps, uh, I'm going for Foulard, albeit the rank outsider in the four o'clock at Donny, the big sprint handicap. Again, I like its course form. I've, I've, maybe it's just the punter in me, but you know when you just have a bit of a feeling about a horse that potentially the bookmakers have got it all wrong? It's certainly not the best horse in the race. It's not the classiest type, but I'm hoping for a really small yard like that that potentially this could be a bad day. Um, and um, it's a real toss-up, I'll be honest with you, between two for my other selection. Um, I think Rolling Dillon's got a decent each way chance in the first at Cheltenham, but I completely agree with you that Cogger going to be the biggest danger. So perhaps it's a bit boring, but I think Mirando, 220, all three of us have agreed. Newbury, decent enough price, I guess, at 5 to 2. So yeah, Mirando, if you're looking for a shorter price horse, and Foulard for an each way punt. Obviously, that's our thoughts for uh, racing on Saturday. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Get in touch, follow us on Facebook. Uh, jump on Twitter, follow us at Pix Paddock. Um, send your comments, drop us a, an email, get in touch any way you can. Hopefully we've picked out a few winners, you'll make a bit of money. And tune in for our weekly news roundup on Monday. Thank you very much for listening and make sure you stay tuned. You're listening to the Picks from the Paddock, Turf Talk Podcast. <laughs>